Welcome everybody to the, oh, I still have April 11th, 2019 um, production club up there. That's when this was supposed to take place and we had our fun snowstorm. So here we are, May 1st, um, doing it instead. And today we are going to talk about camera support systems. So that's everything from tripods to drones and everything in between. Um, some of the stuff we'll kind of demo here. These are all things that we have available um, for checkout here at BCAT. Um, and some of the things that we'll discuss are, um, you know, things that you might be able to rent at like a rental house. Um, some of them are like super expensive, high quality Hollywood type of things that um, you can't rent at just any rental house, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, before we get into that, let's do some introductions. My name is Ben Venar. I'm communications specialist for Bloomington Community Access Television. So um, I pretty much run this whole studio by myself. And I'm Dietrich Nissen. I do playback for SWTV, which covers Edina, Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, and Richfield. So if you're a resident of one of those uh, cities, contact me. I work out of Edina City Hall and do playback from there. But uh, if you're a resident, you are Welcome to come to Ben and, and beg him to use the VCAT equipment. So uh, We would love to have you come and use the equipment. <laughs> um, and uh, Dietrich and I have been partnering pretty much since I started here two and a half years ago, partnering on things like this. Um, we started these production club workshops around that time, um, and uh, as well as a youth program last mm -hmm. summer. Yeah. That was hugely successful. Um, it's coming back this summer even more successful. It's already completely full, all three, all three camps this summer. Um, so that's really awesome. We're really excited to start that um, next month in June already. Um, coming up really fast. Um, why don't we quickly do go around and do introductions with all of you guys. Um, just say your name, where you're from, and if you do a show here, you can mention your show or just say you know why you're interested in the, the workshop tonight. My name is Miles Prawl. I live in Bloomington. I, uh, my daughter Mia took the youth uh, camp last year and she signed up again this year with a bunch of her girlfriends. And so they're interested in making little uh, movies amongst themselves and uh, I think this is another thing they call stop action okay. movies. Mm -hmm. or, various uh, little uh, productions, youtube -y stuff, and so they're interested in that and they're developing their skill. And um, I also uh, run a camera at my church for their um, service uh, once a month, and so I get to uh, get in on that. So uh, rudimentary skills and need to improve. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, my name is Sean Keenan. I'm a videographer. I have my own production company. and called Everest Video, and I primarily do weddings and sports, high school or college sports, or uh, music or dance recitals or corporate video. Um, I live here in Bloomington, and my wife sent me a, a link to this group, a, a meeting coming up last month, and I figured I'd check it out. Cool. Woohoo! Awesome. Welcome. Yeah, welcome, Both of you. Yeah. And our crew, they are running our uh, mobile production switcher back there. They wanted to test it out tonight. We just got that um, at the end of last year, and um, so they're just kind of getting their their feet wet with that a little bit. Why don't you guys introduce yourself? I'm Patty, and I have a local show that I do here, and uh, so it's just exciting to have some new equipment to play around with. Yeah, and I also have a show here on this station. I'm Mari Mendoza. I, my show is Latin Evolution TV. It's for the Latino community. I have uh, been doing that for eight months here in the, the Bloomington, and I'm part of the Southwest too. So I'm pretty happy to check it out this equipment and just kind of feel more comfortable when you get into the field. He didn't mention award winning show. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Latin award winning. Yeah. Latin Evolution it's TV big. won an award in the Best of the Midwest Media Fest. Um, which is coming up uh, uh, next week, I think, um, and that's put on by Wisconsin Community Media. And then they won Best Magazine Show um, in the Hometown Media Awards, which is the award show that the Alliance for Community Media does, which is the big community media advocate um, in the, across the country. So they were competing. I don't know how many, how many different entries they were competing against, but they beat out all of the other magazine show entries. So. That's pretty awesome. So yeah. the the Props awards for that me. awards for that will be coming up in July, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping to be there. Probably going to be there. Ari, I think is going to try to go. Yeah. I think all my crew is, so. is 
he's there already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're so happy for yeah, that. Yeah, excited. Like I said, we have eight months, but we've been doing great. And I mean, yeah. we have all these, this equipment for support, so that's, that's amazing. Yep. Yeah. Good job, Ari. Yeah. Good job, Ari. Um, all right. Well, let's jump into this. Um, there we go. Um, so some of the things that we're going to discuss today, and this list probably doesn't even cover all of the different types of support systems that are available um, in the world, but we'll talk about tripods, monopods, gorilla pods, camera cages slash fig rig, um, the, uh, shoulder mount, camera sliders, cine dollies, Motorized pan tilt heads, steady cam, gimbals, cranes and jibs, and drones is what we'll end with. And so a lot of this, just to define what is a camera support system, what we're really talking about is getting a, uh, some sort of device that turns this, in, instead of you shaking with your little hands, it makes it steady or it gives you the ability to do something some that kind of is, shot yeah, that you can't get any other way. You can't get any other way. Right. Get a shot you can't get just doing it like with your iPhone or anything like that. So all these things are options of, uh, of ways to get to that point. But really the stabilization part I think has been a game changer when you say Ben. Like yeah. that aspect, uh, tripods have been around for forever. Yeah. So that's kind of old school. But some of the new gear out there has really changed up what folks can do on a very low budget, yep. which is really neat. Yep. All right. We'll talk do? about that, yeah. too, in a little bit. We'll start with the basics, tripods and monopods. Um, boom! Where is it? There it is! <laughs> um, available at BCAT. So we have pretty much not these exact same tripods that you, and monopods you see here, but um, very, very similar ones, Manfrotto brand. Um, one of our smaller ones is right there that our DSLR is on right now. Um, the bigger tripods are like this one here um, that we use with our newer JVC cameras. And then we have one monopod um, sitting on the table over there. Um, Dietrich, you want to hold up the monopod? Yeah, yeah. I was going to um, just take the camera sure. off and, and just kind of show really quick a couple, yeah. couple things. So like... Um, yeah. So well, I was just going to say, sure. you know, super quickly, um, with monopods and tripods... With, monop <laughs> with monopods and tripods, um, they all can they all have extensions, several different <laughs> levels of extensions. Obviously, the main difference is you know mono versus tri, right. three versus one. Tripods have three legs. Monopod has one, so you kind of you have to hold on to a monopod, but um, uh, it allows you to get some different types of shots that you can't get with a tripod. Obviously, a tripod is going to be much more stable. You can just set the camera on it and forget about it, like we we're doing with these here, um, or you can do like pans and tilts, things like that. Monopods, you're going to be able to do much more kind of, you can do like sweeping shots, you're going to be able to do some yeah. cooler kind of overhead type of sweeping shots, um, especially if you have a head on your monopod. We don't on this one, but like in the picture here, this one has a head on it. Mm -hmm. I should order a head for that, actually. That would be pretty cool. And, and um, one of the cool features of it, at least this monopod, they make adapters now that spread out so you can actually mm -hmm. get kind of a, a more stabilized shot. I've seen folks who, you know, they'll let it go and it'll be stable. I would I never do that. I wouldn't. I would never do that with B-Cat's equipment, yeah. especially. But, you know, whatever. Yeah. You gotta live a little, right? It's like a mini tripod. Almost. Yeah, or you could, you could do the, what Ben was talking about, use it almost like a like spear. A boom I don't know if you Yeah, like a boom mic, boom pole kind of thing. Um, anyway, those are some different options. And then, um, yeah, so, we'll talk about yeah. tripods a little bit, or is there... I don't know. These are pretty self-explanatory. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah. So they just deploy. When would you use a monopod versus a tripod, Ben? What's a um, good that's, so that's a good. That's a good point to bring up. I would use a monopod in a situation where um, either you don't have much time to set up. Um, you got to. You know, obviously that's going to be a lot quicker to just you know, extend that out and throw it on your, all, all it does is just screws into the bottom of the camera, very right. simple. Um, and it's going to give you enough stabilization that you can kind of keep one hand on the monopod and one hand on the camera and it'll be, you know, pretty stable um, if you're doing just a, a quick shot um, anywhere, really, that you don't have much time to set up or tear down. Yeah. Um, also in tight situations, if you're in a really, really small room um, or, you know, maybe you're doing uh, an interview or something with somebody in like their living room and um, they got a bunch of like furniture everywhere instead of like trying to push all the furniture aside so you can set up your bulky tripod you can just quickly set up a monopod and just start shooting. Um, yeah. When you're thinking of monopod you're uh, primarily uh, video? 
oriented or are you uh, referring to still shots too? I see you had the. You know, they, they work for both. They work for yeah. both. Um, I would say that if you're doing like a long exposure shot, I would use a tripod mm -hmm. because then, you know, with a long exposure, you don't want to touch the camera, otherwise it'll end up blurry, yeah, right? Um, but as far as, as it, if you're using a high shutter speed, right, and you're running around, I feel like this gives you a really good stable platform to shoot yeah. from because it only has to be for that split second yeah. and you avoid the shakiness of your hand. So figuring out where to move really fast is easier with this. Yeah. Um, it, that's just my opinion though. I'm, yeah. If you think yeah. or feel differently, Ben. No, I agree. Um, but yeah, even <laughs> again with like video too, like Dietrich was saying, if you're shooting uh, some type of public event where there's like a lot of people and you're moving from place to place, getting all different kinds of shots of the crowd or whatever, obviously you don't want to be like, oh, excuse me, coming through with your big bulky <laughs> tripod trying to move around. You can just quickly just kind of duck yeah. in and out of, of, of the crowd with your, your monopod pretty easy. Or yeah. nature photography where you're hiking and need lightness. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. I, you know, they make some, I, this one isn't too big, uh, actually, but even for monopods in nature, you can toss this in a backpack when it's, mm -hmm. you know, all collapsed, and they're fantastic. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's one option, at least. Yep. Yeah. So. All right. Anyway. Um, so, kind of similar to tripods, um, the Gorillapod was something that was invented probably about... 10 years ago now, I'd say. We have a very, very small one here. So um, this actually comes in our accessories kit for our GoPro. So we have a, a kit that has a whole bunch of different kinds of accessories and um, that is in there. Um, you wouldn't want to use that with anything bigger than a phone or, or a small camera like a GoPro. Um, it's uh, not gonna hold a DSLR, that's for sure. The legs would probably just collapse. But the thing that's really cool about the, these Gorilla Pods like Dietrich is showing is the legs can bend and then they have these uh, kind of rubber grips all up and down the legs that allow you to like wrap them on to things like poles. Um, you could even wrap it onto like your tripod leg. Wrap it on um, my face. You know, if you, wanted, if you wanted to have another sort of like B-roll camera or something while you're um, getting some, like an interview shot or something, you could just throw it on your tripod and get shots of like the crowd walking around or something like that. Um, and that no, one Ben's right. That one like, work great. But that's all right. I mean, you know, so for like a low angle shot of an interview, if you have a GoPro on this, it works really well as a B cam just to like set the scene behind a subject. Whereas you can get a tighter shot, like your maybe your close up or medium shot of of whoever you're talking to, with your main camera. So mm -hmm. it, there are many ways to use this. I'm trying to think. Well, so I was in Washington D.C. and I actually brought a Gorilla Pod with a DSLR, a, a bigger basically the big brother of this one. And I, I set it on top of a, uh, a motorcycle that was in the race and it was an awesome shot, but all I did was wrap it around this guy's, um, what's it called, the bag holder on the back of a motorcycle. Sure. I don't know what you call that thing, sorry. I'm not a hell's angel or anything, but you know what I mean. So, so anyway, it's just a, it's, it's a very useful uh, and relatively cheap way yeah. to get a shot that you wouldn't normally otherwise be able to get. Yeah. The biggest version that they make of the Gorilla Pod is about a hundred bucks, yeah. so it's pretty cheap. Um, and that's actually, I have that one and I meant to bring it. We'll, we'll yeah. watch this video here too, but um, uh, I have that bigger one that you see right there um, and I meant to bring it and I forgot, but I used that um, when I went to Japan four years ago because mm -hmm. um, I was shooting pretty much just stills with my DSLR and but then I brought my GoPro and uh, I would just quickly throw the Gorilla Pod on, on a pole or something like that and get some time lapses of the crowds in different areas and, and things like that and it worked mm -hmm. really well. Um, but speaking of this video, we're going to watch this one. This guy, Kai, if you've ever heard of him, Kai, Kai W, I think um, he goes by. Mm -hmm. I don't know his last name actually. but. Um, uh, really funny guy. He used to do videos for this digital Rev TV and now he's off doing his own thing. This is one of his earlier videos so he didn't put as much into the audio and the audio is really horrendous in it but he's funny and uh, I think this is a good review of the Gorilla Pod here. So. These rather pricey carbon fiber Gitso tripods are all good and well, but not everybody wants to carry around one of these. So perhaps the answer is the Joby Gorilla Pod. Let me show you what it does. So what the 
key benefits of the Joby Gorillapods? Well, obviously, they're very pocketable. Although you probably wouldn't want to sit down on one of these. This cute little one is suited for compacts. And it comes in a nice Barbie pink color. And we've got his bigger brother. Suitable for SLRs. Although there's another version called the SLR Zoom, which can take an SLR with a zoom lens. Now, apart from the fact that they're light in weight, they're also very flexible with these ball joints. And then you can also you can take this bit off. And the SLR version is pretty much the same, but on steroids. It's got the same rubberized grippy bits here. This one features a nice spirit level, so you know that when things are nice and level. And this also has a quick detach butt plate with a lock. Look just how quick the quick detach is. That was really quick, wasn't it? What's that? You can't afford a Red Rock Micro setup? Why not use one of these then? Follow focus. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. And with rubber feet, it sits quite nicely on objects such as this fire hydrant. It's kind of like a spider with only three legs. Oops. The Joby Gorilla Pods are construction site friendly. And video bloggers might find it useful so that they can do their vlogs while sitting on the bus. Well, supposing you want to take pictures of yourself or video blog while on an escalator, you can do. I think that's about right. And you can even use it while in the wild. I think I've broken that. Uh, let's go. Okay, don't drop. The nice rubbery grippy bits will ensure that it sticks to anything that's stationary. Quite literally anything. It's like a desperate teenager who needs to get laid. They'll mount quite literally anything. Or if you really want to, you can have some upside down action, like monkeys swinging in a tree. And because it's nice and small, you can put it in some quiet places. One problem, however, is that it's not very tall. So if you don't have any poles or bars to clip it onto, then you have to put it on the floor like this. And, uh, hang on, how do I do this? It's a bit wet here. Ah. Oh, God. Oh. I've never felt that pain in my back before. Oh. But you could see that as an advantage. But take this normal, but rather expensive tripod. Does it go down as low as this Joby Gorilla Pod? Nope. Hello. So the Joby Gorilla Pod, great to accompany a normal tripod. Great to have instead of a normal tripod if you're cheapskate. And if you don't want to wield around a big heavy tripod, then it's also pretty decent. So in conclusion, Buy them both. He loves it. Uh, I love Kai. He's you can look him up. He does all sorts of mostly review videos for gear, um, but he's pretty funny. Um, how do I get back into full screen? There it is. Is that a Gorilla Pod brand right there? That one's not. That's just okay. some cheap off-brand thing that. Um, I'll get back into this. But, yeah. I uh, came with my, I, I bought an a accessories kit for our GoPro that, um, that's weird. 
Yeah, yeah not quite that many, but it was off Amazon for like 25 bucks. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I got my son one of those too. Yeah. It's, the, the actual Gorilla Pod is, uh, I feel like, better constructed. Yeah. It's a little f firmer, and when it grips, like, it's going to stay there unless you yank it off and pull the legs out and stuff. So, anyway, yeah. Probably more dur durable. A little more durable, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say so. Yeah. yeah, I've had mine. I mean, I don't use mine all the time, but I've had it for uh, probably six, seven years, and it's, yeah. like, it's pretty much like it's brand new. It, <laughs> it, it takes a beating pretty well, so. That's durable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh yeah, miniature version available at BCAT. Um, so uh, camera cages and fig rigs. So a camera cage is more like the one that you see in the bottom right. Um, it allows you to put a bunch of attachments onto it. Um, uh, we don't have anything like that here, but um, we do have a fig rig. A fig so rig. a fig rig is yep. pretty much just like a steering wheel <laughs> yeah, uh, that's for the camera. Um, the thing that's nice about this one is it's made by Manfrotto, which our tripods are as well. So they use uh, the same size same plates. Plate. Um, and uh, so you don't have to remove the plate from the camera. You can just slide it into this. Um, yep. the, this one here, I think, yeah. did you have a question? Are they industry standard plates or are they proprietary to the, each brand name? Uh, I oh. think they're going to probably be proprietary. I to think each they're proprietary. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. It's a good, it's a good question. Um, but uh, <laughs> on the struggle bus right now. <laughs> I think with you going to lock it in. Yeah, I think with this one, yeah. So this one does have some um, holes on it where you can put some attachments onto it. Um, yeah, yeah. I see what's going on. Um, so you could put some attachments on this one. Um, the one that's in the middle on the picture here is made out of PVC pipe. Um, so, oh, interesting. I think what we need to do is move the plate on this one back. Because it's blocking it. Yeah, because it's blocking it. It's all right. But you yeah. get the idea. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, <laughs> the concept so the is then. One? So that one yeah. in the middle is a homemade one made out of PVC pipe, yep. um, which, you know, it works. Um, but mm -hmm. what essentially what these do, um, especially the, the fig rigs, is they're going to use your, you know, you're probably going to grip it with two hands, most likely, yep. like that. And it's going to use your arms as shock absorbers. So that's what's going to give you that stabilization. Um, we'll talk about some other stabilizers that are going to work a lot better than this. But mm -hmm. this is going to work better than just going handheld. Right. Um, you can also get some cool shots with it by just gripping it with one hand at the top and holding yeah. it down low. Um, so you could do some nice, like following like people's feet, things right. like that. You can get some, you know, pretty easy, like over the head type of shots, like yep. pointing down with it. Um, that's going to be much more stable than trying to hold your camera up like you, this. And you can attempt um, what I was doing earlier, which is that Black Panther shot, oh, yeah. where you're yeah. walking and they walk, and as the guy comes, the camera rotates to show where he is. And then, mm -hmm. Anyway, if you've seen that movie. I haven't, but. You haven't seen Black Panther? Do you see too many Dude, movies. Dude, you're man. killing me. <laughs> it's on Netflix. All right, anyway. Um, <laughs> All right. So, anyway. Anyway. Yes, that is um, <laughs> the difference then in like a camera cage um, is usually they just have one grip on it. You can see with this one here, it has, it's a little hard to see on this TV, but there's just one grip there. So you usually would just grip it like this. Um, but as you can see, it allows you to put a lot more attachments onto it, like microphones and lights and things like that. Um, some of the camera cages, I think maybe this one even probably has some holes here that you can put attachments on for um, things called like, oh, it's on the other side, called a follow focus. So this mm -hmm. device right here is called a follow focus. And you can see there's little gears around the lens. And what that allows you to do is when you're going handheld with it, instead of trying to twist the lens like this, which is kind of an unnatural way to move your hands, it allows you to just go like this. And then those gears will shift the, the focus um, ring on the, on the lens. Um, so that's, those follow focuses, you um, have to have something to attach them to, like a, like a camera cage here. So it's probably attached somewhere down on the side over there. And that's a good um, segue, Ben, if you want to go to the next slide, into this. So a lot of these shoulder mount type things have a, uh, have, are made of rails. So like, let's see, for instance, this is a better example of it, but the follow focus there is usually set on the side. That way you have your shoulder, your body supporting it, and then you're able to use one hand to kind of control the focus and use your body to stabilize it. Mm -hmm. Have either of you used one of these before? 
I'm sure you a long time ago. Yeah, there. Uh, I mean, I, Ben, how how much was this one? Do you remember? It wasn't too bad. I want to say it was around. Yeah. I think it was like between 120 and 150. 150. This one definitely is maybe 70. Maybe less. Maybe less than that. Yeah. yeah I mean, this one, and just uh, we have one ID Dyna. It it's it hurts your shoulder <laughs> after a while. So again, it's this this yeah, setup in the middle is pretty much it's a shoulder mount with a camera cage attached right. to it. Is what it is. So yeah. that's that's why it has the grip on the top as well. So you can go back and forth from doing like low shots with the grip. Right. Um, and then going up on your shoulder and then you can have all these different attachments on it like the follow focus mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. and obviously like Dietrich said the more attachments you add to it the heavier it's going to be um, right. and you're going to get it, tired pretty quick. But. And, and what you do to compensate for that is usually a manufacturer will have a plate so like you can see on here guys like this is where you'd add a counterweight that balances out your equipment so that you're not so front heavy otherwise you're really going to get tired really fast mm -hmm. and so the idea then is to figure out, well, okay, if I have like 10 pounds of gear up front, and I'll probably need another 10 pound weight on the back just so I'm not overly leaning, right? Makes it easier to control, so. Is that uh, still video or both? Usually uh, just video. Usually just video. Yeah. You could use it for still. I've never actually seen that done, though. I haven't either. Yeah. Well, is that a still camera inside of that cage? So this is, it could be a mirrorless or a DSLR. DSLRs, that, most of them can or, shoot video right. nowadays. So. Nowadays, yeah. yeah. But you're right. Yeah, when you think of a still camera, we, we kind of get this image of this, this particular camera, for instance. So like this one can shoot video. Right. I can shoot 1080 HD video, but yeah, it is a... a Photography camera, photo right. camera. So, but then on the back, you'll notice that they have a video option yeah. on most of them now, and I know, so. It shoots video, yeah. but it doesn't really shoot it that well. Oh, you know, it's a <laughs> sure. EOS, Rebels, maybe older. Like a T3i or T2i oh, yeah, T2 yeah, T2 yeah, or yeah, T. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of the newer models of these cameras, and actually, Ben, this is relatively new. When did you yep. buy this one? Just got that in like November. Yeah. Like. Yeah. So. Most of the newer ones will shoot uh, 1080 at, at minimum. Yeah. Like some of the Panasonics and Sonys and shoot uh, 4K. Nikon shoot 4K now. But so, for maybe just short duration? Or you, um, it, you know, it, it, it depends. It varies by camera. Yeah. yeah, it varies by camera. Some cameras have a, sorry, we're going like off. <laughs> but some cameras limit the duration time of, yeah. of the video file size. The so, older ones do, the older Rebels. Because yeah. I have an older Rebel too, and it's, yeah, yeah it does yep. limit. It to like 15 minutes or something like that. Yeah, yeah. This one I don't think, I haven't tried to push it to any kind of limits, but I don't think it has a limit. It'll just, at a certain point, it'll create a new file. Mm. So every like 20 minutes or something like that, it just, but it's seamless. If you put the files back to back, then it'll, you know, it's like there wasn't any kind of break in there, but. What do you shoot with? I'm just curious. What, like in your world? Well, I shoot with a, a Panasonic camcorder. Oh, you do? Okay, and, is it and, a... And I'm just starting to use that as a second, okay. or third camera, actually. Yeah, wow. Well, the Sony gotcha. um, mirrorless. Which one did you go with? The six, Alpha 6500. The 6500, okay. And the you said Panasonic, Panasonic. was the one? Were you using HCX. a DVX one? No, HCX1. HCX1, okay. All right, just, mm -hmm. just wondering. Yeah. Uh, 4K camera. So, so <laughs> sorry, we're talking all these yeah. different things. We're going off on cameras. Yeah, yeah, the, right. So... So this would be more of like your traditional cam, camcorder, right, or video camera, and then this is a mirror. Sorry, no, oh, oh, this baby, Spin it around. this mirrorless, and then this yeah. is a DSLR. Yeah. So anyway, we could go yeah. into the differences, but probably can't yeah. see what Dietrich is pointing at off camera oh, over there. Sorry. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we can. Well, we could show it at the end too, yeah, but. Just move it over um, it's so pretty. We'll talk about this when we talk about gimbals, but this is this is Sean's setup that he, he brought in, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so speaking of like counterweights too, there's uh, we'll talk about them in it more in a little bit, but there's other ways to um, provide relief on your arms and things like that and making things not so back heavy, which mm -hmm. we'll show you in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so camera sliders, um, I've toyed with the idea of getting one here. I if people think that they would use these a lot, um, I can definitely purchase one. They range in price from, you know, about a hundred dollars up to, you know, probably a thousand plus, maybe more, a couple thousand, okay. for some of the the higher end ones. Um, uh, 
but um, we'll watch this video. This will explain better than I can the different types of shots that you can do with a mm -hmm. camera slider. Hello, SLR Lounge. My name is Joseph Cha, and today I want to show you four camera movements that you can do with your slider. Now, before we get into the camera movements, I want to briefly explain the sliders that we use on our SLR Lounge productions. This is the Serp Magic Carpet. It comes in two sizes, 2.6 feet and 5.2 feet. Dad. It also comes motion tracking ready, and when coupled with the Serp Genie, you have an excellent motion tracking and time-lapse setup. The Magic Carpet is versatile, quick to set up, and easy to use. This all-metal construction also makes it extremely durable. So Pai and I recently did a shoot at a local boxing gym, and during that shoot, I wanted to make sure I got these four camera movements on the sliders that we brought with us. So the movement number one is the slide. Now, this camera movement should be obvious because it's named after what the equipment is named after, but it's basically when a camera moves from side to side laterally in three-dimensional space. So you mount your camera on top of the slider and you move it in space. Now movement number two is boom, and you can either boom up or down. And what it basically does is it's moving your camera up and down through space. Now typically we attach the slider to a tripod head, we angle it down, and then we're able to get really nice, smooth, up and down movements with our camera because the slider is a fixed plane. Not quite so smooth there. Movement yeah, number yeah. three <laughs> is a push or a pull. Now a push is when we push in the camera towards our subject, and a pull is when we pull the camera away from the subject. Now a push in is basically where you are helping your viewer focus in on a part of the frame by pushing the camera towards him, and pulling out means you're pulling the camera and revealing more of the frame, revealing more of the composition to your viewers. Now camera movement number four is the parallax. Now the parallax is a really interesting movement because two things are happening at once. In a parallax move, you're sliding the camera in one direction, but you're panning the opposite direction. Now this is really interesting because you're introducing camera movement in your composition while maintaining constant focus on your subject. So there you have it. Those are the four camera moves that you can do with the slider. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more. Don't forget. And if you would like to see more of these don't kind of forget videos, to subscribe. let us know in the comments. Talking about Joe. Today we are talking about I think that's funny though that the, the two two out of the four uh, clips they use as an example there was a little bit of shake. Um, I know. It right. does take I, I feel like Ben I don't know when you use a slider I feel like uh, it, it takes a little bit of practice to get it down smooth. It, Do you have any does. tricks for it? Yeah well so um, as he mentioned in, in the video um, theirs was made out of all metal. There are some that are plastic. The plastic ones you pretty much you have to like lube them up to have smooth movement, or otherwise they're just horrendous. You're gonna get this like, <laughs> like I've used some like that that just, I mean, they're pretty much unusable. Um, some of the higher end ones, they come, you know, with like, uh, they'll be probably aluminum most likely, and they might come with like some like graphite, like lubing on it to make it a little bit smoother, and then you'll, you'll have to reapply that, you know, every now and then. But um, it also depends on how it's attached to the rails as well. This system right here, it's kind of hard to see, but it looks to me like there are little wheels here. Mm -hmm. So the wheels are actually, they're almost like really, really small rollerblade wheels, and they're, they're spinning, obviously, along the rails. That's probably going to be a really, really smooth shot there. Mm -hmm. Other ones are just kind of wrapped around the pole, and they're um, uh, usually like a felt or something like that, mm -hmm. that that's on the inside, and so that helps with kind of you know making it smoother, but that doesn't always work the best either. And, um, and again, you'll probably have to replace that material, that felt, uh, every now and then because it's going to wear down. Um, same with that one. You can see in the bottom left, there's those wheels, kind of gold, gold wheels there that um, will roll along the, the slider. So, right, and they're, um, it, they're dented right there, so they go right along that little track. So, and actually, one of the things we did at Eden to save money was we built one out of PVC pipe. That way you can customize the length of, of the slider itself. Um, and it, it's actually a lot cheaper. Uh, anyway, we can talk about that some other time. But yeah. there are many options as far as building one. So I encourage anybody watching this to look online as well. Yeah. Uh, um, thinking about that. when you have the slider right at your uh, subject in the image that you want, um, uh, when would you use um, the slider to move the camera toward as opposed to zoom? Are you, you changing Ooh. the 
It's a good question. That's a great question. You want to field it? Sure, yeah, I'll field it. Um, so when you, like he was mentioning, if you want to bring focus to a subject or a particular thing, um, you, you would push it, right? Uh, versus what he mentioned as well, pulling it backward to reveal the greater image behind it. Like, for an instance, if you were doing, and I'm so, just, because you mentioned church. Well, here, let me just finish ahead, this example. Yeah, yeah. So if you are in front of a pastor and they're giving this powerful sermon and, and they're looking right here and you pull back and you reveal that they're talking about whatever, that is a powerful shot because, right, you're revealing that, ah, they're, they're somewhere. The inverse of that would be then if someone's getting really emotional during an interview, and they do this a lot in major productions, you slowly push it toward your subject because you're getting more intimate. And then you can see the details, like especially if you get your subject to cry. Sorry, it's a good thing in video. But, uh, <laughs> but showing emotion, right? It's more powerful that way. So. Um, but yeah. yeah. So the difference visually in a shot with a, a doing a slider versus um, a zoom is same with like if you were to use any type of like handheld thing and like walk towards the subject mm -hmm. as opposed to zooming in on them. When you're zooming in, essentially what it's doing, essentially is it's like cropping the frame in is basically what it's doing. When you use a slider or something like that to physically move closer to your subject, it's, you'll notice the biggest difference if you have some objects in the foreground. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to like church, you know, if you do a, a, a low down shot with a slider down the aisle and you slide mm -hmm. forward, you're going to see those pews coming towards, you know, the sides of the camera and like moving, look like, looks like it's moving past the camera as you're getting closer to your mm -hmm. subject. So it's really just like a change in like the depth, um, not the depth of field, but like the, yeah, no, uh, it's um, it's um, it is depth, yeah. yeah, your space. So right, so the difference between what you were mentioning, zooming on a camera, which is flattening that the background with the subject, versus physically moving it, you, it's easier to show than it is yeah. to explain. But and that's subtle difference, really, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's it, there is a difference in it. Like in the example they showed, the lady was standing behind <laughs> the um, the boxing. What is that called? The bag. The bag. Yeah, the, the, um, and and it, it was subtle, but you could see as they were getting closer to her, um, the bag was like it was almost like the bag was moving faster because mm -hmm. it was closer to the camera. Um, so it just there's a there's a subtle difference, but um, but you can see that change in, in the depth and stuff. And yeah. do you ever use it? And I'm just wondering if you ever do this during an interview where you'll just have the camera going back and forth. Mm -hmm during things. So one of the tricks in, in post-production that 4K cameras have allowed us to do is in post, you can create camera movement um, because you're downscaling to 1080, right? So 4K is 4,000 right, resolution. So what I'm getting at is that rather than doing it, shooting a 4K shot and, and doing all the movement in post-production, you are able to physically move that camera and it, it's a very different effect. It, it feels different too when you watch something and you can tell that it's not just some tricky editor moving the camera and recomposing shots, but you'll notice things in the background slowly mm -hmm. uh, slide over whether, and again, I keep going back to church, but like if there's a cross behind somebody and you're slowly moving it across as they're talking about something emotional, it, it just has a very different yeah. feeling. Yeah. So I, it, this is like one of the most underrated pieces of equipment I feel like that's yeah. out there. But you can achieve it actually with some of the other items we'll talk about. Yeah. Yeah, like Dijic was saying, whether you're moving left and right or you're, you're um, going in or out with a slider um, or any kind of handheld thing, um, the, the coolest thing to watch with those types of shots is any objects that are farther away, they're going to move slower than things that are closer to the camera just because of the, the, the focus. Um, uh, I keep thinking the depth. That's the only <laughs> word I can think of to describe it. But yeah, the, there you the go, Patty. Spatial what you say? relationship. Spatial relationship. Thank you. Spatial yeah. relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so um, so it's just you can you can use that to your advantage, you know, to do some really really cool shots. Right. Um, like Dietrich was saying, like maybe the cross in the background is going to be moving like much slower than your subject as you're moving like left right. to right, um, and it just, you know. Most people probably won't pick up on those things, but film people will see that, and it's just kind of a cool effect. So, yeah. 
Are you able to keep your focus on the longer slides when you're coming in? Oh, that? that's a good question. So focus is a, <laughs> that's, that's a good a question. That's um, a good. <laughs> there's all sorts of different things that you can do with focus. You could set, you could get close to your subject first and set the focus on them and then come back out. And then as you're coming, they'll be out of focus when you're starting. And then as you get closer, they come into focus. You could also, if you're really good you, with like a follow focus, you could start with them in focus and then you rack that focus as you're moving in and you keep them in focus the whole time. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult to do. There are people on professional sets, Hollywood sets, things like that, that um, are, uh, they're often called like second camera. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what they do, their only job is just running that follow focus. So there's someone who's actually physically like moving the camera around and then there's just a person on the side just moving that focus. And that's their, that's their sole job for the whole, whole thing. So, it, it really, no, and, uh, he's absolutely right. I mean, again, the more money, the bigger productions, yeah. they have the ability to do that. But if you're one man banding, like, or one person banding, uh, and you're just doing it all on your own, what I like to do at least is I'll, I'll set um, my focus points and on a follow focus, you're able to make marks on it with like an uh, erasable marker. And then that way, when you're doing your movement, you know where to stop. Yeah. Because that can kind of be the hardest part, is yeah. figuring out, yeah, is, are point. they in focus or are they not? So when I do interviews with a slider, unfortunately I don't get to do them a ton, but when I do them, I usually do that and I'll just talk banter with the interview subject beforehand while I'm setting that up and checking audio and doing all the other stuff you do. But that's one of the things on your checklist is, Okay, set your focus points, and then that way, when you're shooting, you really don't have to concentrate on <laughs> much except for the smooth motion and then rotating your focus. Cool. Anyway, that's, yeah. one, that's one way to get around it. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know. There's yeah. so many different ways to do the same thing, though. I, yeah. Anyway. And a lot of cameras nowadays too have uh, touch screens on them and they have the ability to do like a touch focus thing. So mm -hmm. like you could do like as you're like coming into your subject, you like tap on their face and the camera's going to automatically like focus for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's technology is advancing yeah. with those types of things. But yeah, focus, <laughs> focus can be really tricky, but, um, but yeah. It takes the fun out of it. It's good enough that it does a good job of focusing. Depends on the camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it is. Depends and, on the camera. And your understanding of how to use that equipment. Really, yep. it comes down to, do you know your own equipment well enough to use it in a way that is going to yep. you know, result in an awesome production? Or did you totally pull focus on the cross behind the guy and not on the guy's face? And in post, you're like, nah. Yeah. It, th that's happened to me with other stuff. So. I feel your pain. Um, <laughs> so we're going to try to go a little bit quicker some of these because we still got a yeah. lot to talk about. So um, Cine dollies, um, I don't know if you have more experience with these. I don't have a ton. Um, but there's all sorts of different kinds. The two that you see on the left are like tabletop dollies. Um, they are meant to have, there's little attachments that you can put on them to have a little arm come up so your camera's you know, up above the wheels. Obviously, you can't really screw a camera into that middle part there because it would just rub on the wheels uh, but you have it up above those wheels and then you just have it on a tabletop and you can do like some you know same type of thing like pushing in and pulling out or go, you know uh, panning left and right um, or dollying left and right um, some of the bigger ones like the one you see in the middle there that's one that you'd probably see more on like a professional set mm -hmm. um, and again there's that counterweight there um, to make sure that the the seat that the the videographer is sitting on isn't like going <laughs> the whole time as they're moving, um, and uh, and then somebody you have to have another person helping because they're gonna be on the the end there pushing it or pulling it along, um, and then there's other ones that you can use on tracks. Um, we. Um, uh, well, actually, I don't think we have any types of dollies oh. like that here. But um, those basically, like Dietrich was talking about, this is almost essentially a slider. It's really. a slider. Um, <laughs> it's, but yeah. uh, but the part that it's on down here is is basically like a dolly that um, uh, has those sort of uh, s skateboard type of wheels on it to roll along that. I was going to say, you know, I've used these a couple times. I, to be honest with you, I don't like them because if there's even a pebble, it's you're going to you're going to see that little pebble bump you know, as mm. your camera goes. So if you know you're shooting on a super flat surface like a table, like, like something like this, they're perfect. They work really, really well. But they're kind of limited in scope. And I, th I feel like there's other pieces of equipment you could invest in that will be able to get that same kind yeah. of effect. 
Well, um, going back to those okay. sliders, you know, they make some that are really, really small right. and lightweight. They're very easy to deploy. They just have these tiny little legs, um, and you just drop them on the ground and throw your camera on it, and you're ready to go. And you can get the same effect as you can with those those little tabletop dollies. Yeah. Um, and then with those, like he showed in the video, you can most of them, not all of them, but a lot of the sliders, you can attach to a tripod if you need it to be up higher or put it on a table or whatever. The the advantage to this piece of equipment, though, is the ability to do the circle motion. Whereas a slider, it just goes literally left to right. Yeah. You can encircle a subject. So if if that's something you're trying to get. Yeah. Something I do for weddings, I've got a tripod and a dolly for my tripod yep. and for the first dances. Oh, sure. I yeah. I navigate around and get some that's, awesome shots. Yeah. That's exactly how you would use it, too. Yeah. yeah. That's Very a great cool. way to use Definitely. it. They do make sliders that are curved, but then that's then you're limited to only being right. able to curve with them. Then yeah. you can't go straight left and right. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then like the advantage of the dolly, like Sean was saying, is that you're just on wheels on the ground and you just move it. Um, well, it, we've got some in our studio cameras there, but you can just keep moving around your subject. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with, uh, you know, if you've got like a track or a slider, um, anything like that, you're limited to, you know, how long that <coughs> slider is. So. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's move on from that. Motorized pan tilt heads, have you ever used one of these? I've, no, I've seen them used. I've got a video that kind of describes them a little bit better, so I was maybe, gonna say, well, maybe we, we should let the video talk about them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we could talk about them a little more. I don't have a ton of experience with these, but this one's a little bit longer video, so we're only gonna watch uh, about two and a half minutes. Hey guys, I'm Kyle with Rhino. This is Rhino Arc 2. It's a robotic camera assistant with a 15 pound load capacity that pans, tilts, focuses, and controls your slider for incredible video and time-lapse shots. It's designed to replace your fluid head as the ultimate B-roll machine. When we looked at our workflow as filmmakers, we realized we do a ton of different things, from narrative docs to interviews, weddings, time lapses, and endless B-roll to make it all cohesive. Our goal with Rhino Arc 2 is to make your filming process more efficient so you can focus on telling your story. The best part about Rhino Gear is how quick it is to set up. Rhino Arc 2 is no different. Using the ergonomic dual joystick controls, set up a repeatable four axis multi-point move in seconds and use the joystick or iOS app to control the speed of playback. You don't always need a slider, but you always need B-roll. That's why we created Rack Mode. When paired with Rhino Focus, simply move your camera and set your focus. Move to where you think you'll pan or tilt and set your focus again. Now, as you move, your focus will automatically rack perfectly as you control your movement in real time with the joystick. Imagine how much time you'll save nailing focus on the first try. Doing professional interviews is a staple for most filmmakers. Adding motion to your shot ups your production value and is a great way to land higher paying gigs. But what happens if your subject changes their sitting position or moves out of focus? With interview mode, you can pause the looping slider by touching the joystick and discreetly reframe and refocus without having to set up a new move and risk killing the moment. Time lapsing is one of the favorite parts of my job. Now with Arc 2, you can make it even more dynamic with four axes, pan, tilt, slide, focus. We have a new feature out called Light Lapse. Won't be available on launch, but will allow you to beta test it when it's ready. It allows you to get holy grail day to night time lapses with the touch of a button using a light sensor and a new iOS app. So a pretty sweet piece mm -hmm. of equipment. I don't remember how much that one costs, but um, whoops. Um, a million bucks. It's, yeah, it's, it's not cheap, um, but obviously, you know, you can get a lot of really cool shots. And um, like you said in the video, going back to like the focus, you know, you can set your focus ahead of time. You have two different focus points, and then all you do is you just hit play on it, and it's just going to follow the follow the uh, motion fancy, and, and focus at the same fancy time. Fancy whippersnappers. Yeah. Stick to the old so, school yeah. hand. 
Yeah. This so. is my focus. <laughs> but those things are pretty sweet. Um, I don't That's think it's very cheap. <laughs> I want to say when I looked this up, I want to say this was somewhere like around like three grand or oh. something like that. <laughs> Two thousand, two to three grand. I want to say I to could be it. wrong, but <laughs> anyway, Holy study smart. cam. So Ooh. I love talking about the history of this because um, this is really where uh, handheld stabilizers kind of started. So um, the study cam that was invented by Garrett Brown, who we see there on the left, um, in 1975, and it uses a counterweight system to counterbalance the weight of the camera and mechanically isolates the operator's movement allowing for a smooth shot even when the camera moves over in a regular surface. Um, so I'll show you some examples of shots that, or one example of a shot that he got um, with his steady cam. But as you can see there, <laughs> he's got a lot of gear there. That cannot be very lightweight. Um, but he's got the counterweights on the bottom of those two cameras there. Um, his are, in particular, are attached to a vest um, with these arms that have, you know, they swing out all sorts of like different ways up and down. Um, but it allows him to do all these really like fast movements, you know, things like this um, very quickly. Um, there are kind of miniature versions of the steady cam called the glide cam, which um, you know you can have a very minimal amount of equipment on like that. But again, it's got that counterweight um, system down below there, and then this handle here would swing out and allows you to kind of you can put one arm on the the pole in the middle, and then one one hand on the handle there, and you can do kind of like some cool you know sweeping shots with it and stuff. So the tough part about steady cam, so I have a glide cam system at, at my home. And the benefit of it, like Ben was saying, is that you can, it acts independently. The part that takes a long time is balancing your equipment mm -hmm. up top with the weights on the bottom. I don't know if you've done that. It's taken, yeah. like when I first got it, it took me six hours to get the balance perfect. Just because I had a mic on top um, and I had like a, a light and all this other stuff that I was trying to balance out. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one disadvantage of this is that you'll have to spend time balancing it out. Yeah. Whereas like with a vest, you'd still have to do that, but at okay, least you have. Your, and that's <laughs> the same. You have to balance yeah. gimbals as well, which we'll yeah. talk about in a little bit. But that'll that'll change. You'll have to change your counterweights depending on what type of attachments you have to your camera because you're not going to always use the same things right. every single time. Um, so then you got to spend that time, you know, readjusting your your counterweight system. So. Um, so that's a good point to bring up, but um, still on the steady cam here. So um, he's used his invention in many that's Hollywood cool. films throughout his career, but perhaps most notably in The Shining. This is really where the steady cam kind of blew up. Um, so you can see on the shot on the left there, that's the shot out in the hedge maze, um, and he's got just one camera on with the the vest system there. Um, so that shot of them running through the hedge maze, that hedge maze. If you've ever seen the movie, um, very iconic shot. Another iconic shot here was done with this setup here. So he's sitting on uh, just an old um, uh, wheelchair and the camera is actually on the bottom there and the counterweight is up on top and, um, and that allows him to get this awesome shot here. I'm not going to go full screen with this one but Had to have had a very well oiled wheelchair to not make oh, yeah. noise. I think they added sound in post. Yeah, they might have. <laughs> spot on. If it they is did spot it in post. On, yeah. I'm just trying to imagine how much it cost for them to make that yeah, right. at the time. Awesome carpet. <laughs> Thank you. I have that in my house. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Photogenic. <laughs> so you get the idea. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to another shot. How many miles does he travel by now? Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's it's so a lot corridor. Uh huh. Just another example of the same kind of setup, but this one here, he's purposely going much slower than the subject, letting the su subject get away from him, but still doing that steady cam shot on the wheelchair, following him. Trying to provide suspense. Yeah. Some motion in the moment. Um, and that's yeah. yeah. So that's that's a pretty awesome invention, and it's really led the way to a lot of things that we have today. Yes. So um, Garrett Brown is the man. 
why. <laughs> All right. Um, oops. There we go. So another quick video that we're going to watch. Well, this was actually, it's a little bit longer of a video, but um, we're going to watch just the first couple minutes of it. Um, so uh, a steady cam combines a stabilized, steady footage of a conventional tripod mount with the fluid motion of a dolly shot and the flexibility of handheld camera work. While smoothly following the operator's broad movements, the steady cam's arm absorbs jerks, bumps, and shakes while its most frictionless while its almost frictionless gimbal pr gives precise control of the camera and framing. So this video is awesome. I came across this a few years ago, The Art of Steadicam. It's just uh, a bunch of shots that Hollywood movies have done with the Steadicam. Um, and again, you can look this up if you want sometime. It's on Vimeo um, if you want to watch the whole thing. But we're just going to watch a couple minutes. If it'll let me go full screen, there we go. idea. Um, watch some of your favorite movies now and I guarantee you there's going to be steady cam shots in like all of them. Mm -hmm. um, well a lot of newer ones now are probably done with gimbals but which we'll talk about next. Um, but I think somewhere in this is the shots from The Shining which is always great. Um, gimbals! Segway Woo! into gimbals! Woo! <laughs> So what gimbals are is um, they are a three-axis motorized stabilizer. Um, we'll show you our GoPro one there, but there's a variety of different types out there. There are handheld ones for smaller cameras, smaller like DSLRs and stuff, um, which is uh, like what Sean brought in here. Um, you've got some bigger ones where the camera actually sits down below, and then your three axes are here, um, one that, that goes like this, and then I think another one that goes like this, maybe, um, or I don't remember exactly where they all yeah, are. Yeah, so the Somewhere axis is, no, oh, you're spot on. Close? It's right there, <laughs> right there, yep, and then where's the other one? I think it's right up there. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the concept, though, Ben Samba, is that three-axis thing. So all of these do, essentially do the same thing as a steady cam. And if you look at this device, for instance, you have three motors that are all working to basically reduce the jerks, the bumps, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and this guy, so Ben, this is your baby. Yep, really so um, this thing's pretty sweet. As you can see, the camera just stays on the exact same plane the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, as I tilt up and down, um, go side to side, that camera's always gonna stay on the, that same plane, and that allows you to pretty much run with this thing, and you're not gonna get very much shake in it. Um, 
these things have gotten a lot of uh, criticism for that. People think that they're too smooth. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of professional filmmakers want to see some of that shake in there, and so um, you know, so I feel like some people, some professionals are going back to doing more um, <laughs> like steady cam type of work for that reason. Um, but uh, but for us, for okay, us, for the little guys in the world yeah. who are like, yeah, a hundred bucks is a lot of money. Okay. For me, this works, and it works exceptionally well. It does. Um, the, the best part about this, so one of my favorite tricks to do is, Ben, I don't know if you've ever done this with a, uh, a shoot here, but you can hand it through, oh, yeah. like little openings and windows so, and stuff to another person, yeah. and it keeps that shot going. So say you're following somebody, and like you run to a kitchen wall, and they're going through a door. Hand it through the kitchen to your yeah. buddy who's on the other side, and you just take it, and you follow the action. We'll and watch a sim an example. Oh, okay. Of that Sorry, video. spoiler. But no, 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 no. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and talk about it. That's but, cool. But that's one of the best tricks about that. And I think one of the coolest things I realized about it too, um, it's not so much maybe with this one, but uh, DJI, another company out there, makes um, one called the Osmo, and you can have. So Ben, I. Can you put that on your phone? Like, use your phone as a viewfinder. Oh, uh, you, you, you can. That? You can attach okay. it uh, wirelessly, um, but there's not anywhere to actually attach the no, phone no, no. to this. So you have to just hold your phone in your other hand. So which... this is a technique that that I I don't know how I came across it, but what you do is you would take the camera, and normally a steady cam operator has to walk backwards when they're following a subject, right? So the idea is like subject, subject, right? What I've learned now is that I hold it in my right hand and I hold my phone up here as mm. a viewfinder and I walk forward and I just use this because it, it's showing me what I'm shooting. And once you master that, you can go up and down stairs like I've crawled through a, a tunnel like doing that and it works really, really well. So again, it, the equipment is out there mm. where you can basically, I don't know, do anything yeah. to the limit of your imagination. But that's one technique yeah. that I wish they would promote more of. Yeah, because normally normally useful. walking backwards, like you was talking about, you got to have another person there to spot you, otherwise you're going to run you're into things. So if someone's, yeah. someone's walking forward, kind of holding on to the back of your right. shirt, pulling you along to make sure you don't run into things. Right. Um, but doing it the way Dietrich said allows you to do it by yourself. Yeah. Um, I was just going to point out with this particular gimbal, I think they all have similar functions, but there is a lock. You can hold a lock button here, and then that allows you to tilt mm. the down um, if you want to still do like tilt things like that um, it's a little tricky to get it back balanced right when you do that um, there we go um, and then it also if you just flip it upside down it automatically flips itself over um, and so that allows you to get those like low angle shots you know following someone or you could start low and like come up like this you know type of thing there's all sorts of different shots you can get and we're gonna watch that right now I really like a lot of this is an older uh, video six years old now but um, this was one of the first systems that this company Freefly made um, which this is a bigger um, I'm gonna shut this down real quick this is a bigger uh, gimbal like the one in the middle right here um, but um, you'll see a lot of the different shots that they're able to get with this it's pretty sweet this one at the end here with the taxi is amazing oh that's the next one. Skipping ahead here. Hi, this is Vincent Laferre and Tab Fershaw from Freefly with a behind the scenes view uh, of the first short shot with the Movi. Yep. And what we really want to try to explain was why uh, this is an important device and why it might just change things. If you can just see this last shot, Tab was running at full speed and the actual resulting shot is completely smooth. And one of the first things that I think any of us realize, whether we're shooting with an iPhone, a 5D Mark II, or just about any motion camera, is that it's actually really hard to stabilize, even when you're standing still, let alone uh, when you're trying to do a pan or a tilt, let alone running uh, or in a car. Yeah. And I think we've all dreamed of flying with our cameras and doing these incredible shots since we started in video. And um, some of you may know I shot with the 5D Mark II a few years ago, and I was very limited in the way I could move the camera. And this gimbal to me is 
kind of that, that bridge to allowing us to imagine a shot. Here we are on set and just discussing it and within a relatively few minutes be able to execute it uh, with a relatively small team of people. Yeah, and go down this staircase, which was incredibly tight, and uh, you know I could barely fit fit down just myself. And to be able to pull off that shot going down, it was pretty cool. And there's the handoff, and you saw the camera moved in the behind the scenes, but look at how smooth it is here. And the reality is, cinema is about working with other people, it's about working with other professionals, and that's the beauty of it. But we don't always have that at our availability or at our disposal. And in this case, um, if you have a gimbal operator that's solo, you can do a lot of stuff. But if you have a second operator as well, you can do even fancier takes like this, where you're just running through a variety of scenes and pulling off stuff that generally with would take uh, quite experienced levels of uh, steady cam operators or gear like jibs and sliders or even cable cams. Uh, r running down stairs like this just and getting this kind of result is just not something you can generally do very easily. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important thing that I really grew to love about the system is uh, you, you separate the jobs of moving the camera and pointing the camera and what that does is allows the person who's moving the camera, you know, I can just focus on running and not tripping and falling. And uh, Hugh, you know, Hugh's operating on the remote here and he's focused completely on framing. So we, we divide the labor up and I think the result is better for it. And what I wanted to do as well is I wanted to shoot the entire short with just this one device. So every yep. shot you've seen in the resulting short uh, was shot with the Movi. And that was a key point. Here you see it on uh, roller skates. And uh, we're running after a cab and when people see this shot they're like, okay, I guess it's a steady cam guy running really quick. And the camera just places itself through the window, and one of the producers that saw this said, well, where's the, the platform for the Steadicam guy to stand on to make this shot? How did you pull that off? And then here, uh, John pulls away from the cab and keeps writing, and then people go, well, how did you do that? And the reality is, in the cinema world, we have lots of limitations, and this tends to really eliminate them. That's why I find that at the, at the start, this is an incredibly exciting um, yeah. piece of future technology that will really be applicable to high-end filmmakers in Hollywood, all the way down shot. to indie filmmakers. Beautiful. Could you imagine, like, if they hadn't blocked that off, though, and he runs <laughs> right... Or, oh, like, if he hit a little bump <laughs> on the curb or something? Um, yeah, so, like, like they were saying in this video, um, there's this particular uh, gimbal also allows you to attach a remote to it, so the, the gimbal, the axis that's on... The inside right here is controlled by a remote, so they're able to, to um, tilt the camera up and down and pan it left and right um, separately from the other the stabilizing axes on them. Um, but that allows some unique shots like they are talking about. Then the person who's actually operating the gimbal, they all they have to worry about is just movement, running you know towards the subject or away from the subject or whatever, and the other person is actually framing the shot. So. Yeah, I love that video. It's such a cool you, you can find this. So this is the behind the scenes for this. They have the short out there as well. You can see the whole thing. Um, it's pretty sweet. Um, so I thought that this this is like a super long video. It's like 20 minutes or something. So we're not going to watch the whole thing. Um, but I thought this was an interesting uh, shootout that these guys did, a Steadicam versus a Ronin gimbal. So we'll take a look at this as well. Hey guys, it's Bart Johnson here and today I came out to the park and I wanted to run some tests and share something with you guys that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. So now that three axis gimbals have been released and are becoming all the rage and they're becoming so much more affordable, everybody wants them. A lot of people are saying that they're basically the be all end all in terms of camera movement, that steady cams and sliders and dollies are obsolete now and that these three axis gimbals are just gonna wipe them out. But I really don't think that's the case. It's the same sort of uh, mentality where there's a tool for every job and there's some stuff that steady cams can do better and there's some stuff that gimbals may do better and I wanted to test that out. So today I'm out here with my friend David Aronson who is a professional steady cam operator and uh, David you brought along your steady cam rig here to I did against uh, my DJI Ronin to see how they each perform. So what did you bring along? Uh, this is a, a bare bell sled. Uh, the rest of it is a Steadicam Master Series, it's called. Um, it's a, a Pro Series rig. It will uh, fly anything from a DSLR to an Alexa. 
Wow, um, so you can go smaller all the way to bigger, very similar to the weight capacity of, of the Ronin here. Yep. This one will do DSLRs and then all the way up to about 16 pounds. So maybe a very stripped down Alexa, but yeah. But yeah. So, um, and this is obviously a big professional system. It is. Obviously there are a lot of people who have glide cams and smaller stuff, they're gonna be limited, but the sort of, sort of the functionality is basically the same kind of principle, right? It's the same kind of principle. It's, it's moving the center of gravity out from inside the camera down to the gimbal where you can balance and control it. And you have your arm, which attached to the vest, which, it does. which absorbs the shock and sort of takes care of your vertical axis of motion. Yeah, that supports the rig and isolates it on the, uh, the moving in X, Y, and Z. Now that's one of the things that's a big difference between the three axis gimbals here, like the Ronin. Now the Ronin, um, it does use, you do have to balance it. So it does have a gravi gravity aspect to it in the beginning there, getting it balanced. Um, but then it uses electronic motors to actually do the stabilization. And it does not have anything to take care of that axis, that fourth axis mm. of, of vertical translation. So that could be one of the things that we see a difference in the tests if you're yep. going upstairs or something like that. So today what we're going to do is we're going to run each of these systems with the same camera. We're using the Sony FS700 and the same lens. We have a 24 millimeter lens on there, EF mount with a speed booster. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to be using the same system on each rig and we're going to be running it through some tests. We're planning on doing a follow mode test, um, a leading mode test. We're planning on doing some turns, some tight corners. Uh, we're gonna try and do some stairs, and we wanna try and get in there if we can do an orbiting shot, mm -hmm. um, keeping your subject in the center as you go around. And then maybe some other tests along the way if we don't lose our sunlight and we've got the time. We'll do something fun. Cool. All right, well, uh, let's go ahead and get set up. We're gonna run the steady cam first through, uh, through everything, and uh, we'll let you guys see the results. So you get the idea. Anyway, this is actually, it's a really good video to watch. Yeah. I've watched it several times. But... Oh, you've seen that one? Yeah, I always laugh because I'm like, guys, really? You didn't find like an actress or actor to like oh, yeah. do the test? You're like, you're like, nah, brah, you just, you just go ahead. You're, you're just, you're a good looking guy through a flowery garden. You fit right in. What? No. Is that on YouTube or? On it is on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it is cool. No. What is the channel uh, uh what's his bart name johnson. bart johnson productions so you can look that up yep right mm -hmm. all right um anything else about gimbals steady cams no? I, I mean i've used them i've used the osmo type quite a bit and i've used uh the ronin s which is very similar actually sean i kind of want you to show off this thing the, the pilot fly but it's similar to this where they all pretty much do the same thing, which is the motorized part balances it out, makes it relatively smooth. I'm, I don't think there are any other tricks that I can think of offhand. I don't know. I've seen the, uh, the attachment for a tripod like that. What, what do you think is the benefit of that? Why would you attach a gimbal to it? Oh, just a place to 
just to Set have a down. place yeah. to rest. Do you okay. ever do shots with, with the tripod, so having it attached and just having the head move it? I actually haven't. I, I, I've only used it on one shoot shot so far. Oh, okay. Shoot and, and, um, with sparrow just and the gimbal. Mm -hmm. But I, I can foresee using this you know, at, a, at a wedding event just as a stabilizer for the, for the ceremony, and then you can take it off and, and follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Run through. I, I think the one thing I will mention is that I've <laughs> I attempted to use uh, uh, more of a telephoto lens, but I, I swear anything above like maybe 30, 30 millimeters, it, it just makes you nauseous. At least it makes me nauseous whenever I shoot. So what I'm getting at is use a wide angle lens typically with this um, because it's just so much easier to follow your subject mm -hmm. versus a telephoto lens where it's you know obviously tighter on, yeah. on something. But I, that's that's just my personal opinion. I'm sure there are other people out there with the opposite opinion. But yeah, that's and what I'm and going back to the focus question with these two, um, so uh, a big component of keeping your subject in focus has to do with the depth of field. Um, so if you have a camera that can, its iris can open really, really wide to like f1.8 or lower, um, it's going to be much harder, especially with something like that where you're following a subject to keep your subject in focus. Um, unless you have one of those cameras that has a touch screen that you're able to just like keep tapping your subject and it's fast, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it, it depends on the camera. Um, so with, you know, when you're using something like this, it's going to be a lot easier to shoot at um, a much uh, uh, higher um, f-stop number, so like you know, right. uh, like f f10 or f11 or whatever, and above, because um, that means that your iris is then more closed down, which gives you it gives you less depth of field, so you don't get quite that you know kind of nice cinematic look to it. But it's going to be much easier to keep your subject in focus as you're following them around. One thing that is pertaining to that with this camera, I haven't used it yet, but uh, it has the ability to record somebody's face. And it'll focus on sure. that face. Keep so you can have multiple the face. faces and yeah. switch them in order which one takes priority if there's two of those oh. faces. Oh, that's face. super nice. cool. So yeah. stay focused on your subject. Yeah, yeah, Sony is definitely ahead of the game with their, well, mirrorless in general and with, uh, with doing the facial recognition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've seen a few people comment on that comparing because Sony's had mirrorless cameras out for five, six years now and, yeah. and Canon and Sony, uh, Nikon just got into the game last year um, and uh, uh, that was one of the big criticisms of the, the first uh, mirrorless cameras that Nikon and, and especially Canon have is their focusing is not super accurate and the facial recognition especially is like mm -hmm. pretty atrocious. The new EOS R is apparently just just atrocious for facial it, recognition. Yeah. So no, I mean, I shoot with a Panasonic GH4, and for me, I yeah, I'm constantly uh, manually focusing with it, which is why I stick to wide angles. And mm -hmm. like you were saying, Ben, you stick to f stops above a 10 or 11. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you you lose the focus on your subject. Um, I did attempt it at 1.8. That was the worst mistake yeah. of my life, and yeah, <laughs> that didn't turn out so hot. Um, yeah. But this is really cool. I didn't know about that feature. Uh, did have you tried have you tried doing any low light shooting with this yet? Uh, and did it not yet. So, not, not yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm anxious to. Yeah. Yeah. Out this oh yeah. I'm I'm really curious if you go to a uh, uh, like those candlelight. Uh, Sometimes they do them in parks where they have the bags of candles oh, that yeah. light up, and it's really pretty. Um, I just find it almost impossible to shoot though because yeah. you're, yeah. Anyway, I, I'd be curious to know if you do something like that. Send it our way. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. No, I don't have anything else. Cool. Um, All right. Yeah. So cranes and jibs. Oops. So um, cranes and jibs, essentially the same thing. Jib is. Pretty much just a small crane, really. Um, all of these three here, I would probably consider them jibs because they are a little bit on the smaller end and they're all able to just mount on tripods. Um, they make even like smaller ones than these here. These look relatively robust. Um, but what these allow you to do is, uh, you know, just like any kind of crane like you would see on like a construction site or something like that. Um, it, well, it has a counterweight system, first of all, just like the like gimbals would and the steady cams and things like that. You're going to have a counterweight on the back end, which you do have to spend some time figuring out 
um, you know, how much weight you're going to need to, to counterbalance your particular camera. Um, but that allows you to get like some sweeping shots starting like really low, coming up high, um, or you could start up, up higher and, and do some like overhead kind of shots panning left and right. Um, there's a huge variety of jibs and cranes out there and what they can do. The one that's on the far left, um, you can see how it's very, very high up in the sky, or you know, very straight up almost, but the camera is pointing straight out. Theirs has a system on it. It's like a little crank thing. You can kind of see the handle for it. And it allows you to, um, well, you can see the string especially, but you can, you can crank that and it's going to tilt the camera up and down. So as you're, as you're like sweeping up, you can keep the camera you know, pointing at your subject or whatever. Whereas a lot of these other ones, unless you've got, uh, you can, some of these you can attach the uh, head from a tripod on it up here, um, but then, you know, you have to have, basically have your camera pointed still um, at the start, because once it gets too high, you're not able to reach up there and tilt it down anyway, but, um, but it would allow you to at least like tilt the, the, the head on it, but like this one here, this one can't tilt. So as you're like coming up, your camera's just kind of pointing straight out the whole time, and if your subject's down here, you're going to end up going way up above their head, you know. Um, versus like one on the left that you'd be able to tilt down as the, the crane is or the jib is coming up and ki uh, keep your subject centered. Um, so um, Definitely easier to use on like a concerts and controlled environment situations yeah. like a church. Um, I, I've never seen one used in a live production like where you'd be, so that's I guess one advantage of like gimbals and all these little these little components that you can be more mobile but in a controlled environment like a crane is really cool we used to do a, sh a thing called taste of edina um it was a cooking competitions uh, over at the weston hotel in edina and we used a jib and what we would do is you can take one of the cameras and just attach it on a hook and then have that camera point down but then if you need it you can slowly lower it as it gets down somebody can come up unhook it and then walk with it Right, so those are different ways to use it. I'm sure you guys have like Ben. Have you used it at a concert before? I haven't used them at any kind of any concerts, concerts or anything. Okay. No, I, I the the public access station I came from before here. We had a small one, um, and uh, it got used quite a bit. Actually, there was a couple of churches that would use it, um, and uh, I'm not entirely sure what the the shots exactly that they got, but I think they just had it in the back and it allowed them to get this, you know, they, it would be a wide angle shot again, wide angle lens, and it just allowed them to get these nice kind of like sweeping shots from the back of the church of the crowd and mm -hmm. um, and everything and, and just these high up shots that you wouldn't be able to reach handheld, you know, and it's obviously going to be much more stable as well. Um, but yeah, just get these nice pretty sweeping shots, high angle sweeping shots. You can do, like I was saying, like some nice revealing shots. So like if you are shooting like a crowd, you know, you could start out like low and then you come up and you reveal that there's just like thousands of people going back, you know. Um, so things like that. Um, cranes, on the other hand, there's obviously going to be probably this crane here is probably million dollar crane I would imagine, mm, um, yeah. but this was used on the set of the Borgia Borgias Borgias is that how you say it Borgias the Super Techno 100. Um, this is a, a pretty sweet sweet video too. Ah! We'll talk about that next. Panic. So this obviously they have an entire crew just to run this That's a giant huge crane. Giant. They got a crew of probably like ten guys just to run this one thing. Just the amount of effort. It was probably used for like two, two shots. Set. Yeah, <laughs> maybe two shots. <laughs> Hi, my name's Darren Percy. I'm a crane technician from Panavision, UK. Uh, and, and well, not just the UK, all over really, because we go everywhere. As you can see, we've brought the big 100 foot techno crane out, and um, basically, we've been brought to Prague to see the challenge what we could do bringing the crane here, which I think we've achieved. And it takes like, there's one day rigging, 
one day shooting, one day de rigging, and that's like seven of us all mucking in together and working really hard to do what we've done. As you can see by the dirt on my t shirt, I don't just stand there and do nothing. Hello, my name is Pavel, and I'm key grip on uh, Borgia season three. We was expecting like uh, it'll be very hard to operate the crane and move the crane from one uh, location to the other one. And finally, we did very, very fast, and everybody was very happy. We, we can move the crane and shoot again on another set in like 20 minutes. It was very, very nice. My name's James Welland, I'm the DO I am the DOP on Borgia 3, um, filming out in Prague, out in the big field in Milovice. Um and we were using the uh, Technocrane, Technocrane 100, which I think is the first time it's been used in Prague, um, and was shipped over last week and set up by uh, Pavel, our really good grip, and two grips from London, um, Darren and Colin, I think, came over, it was great to see them. Um, and it was a really useful tool for us. We needed a big shot. We couldn't really risk using any sort of um, small helicopter. Um, and we didn't really like the look of the small helicopter. We thought about wire cams, but in the end we decided to use the Techno 100 and to give it a go. And one of the things that was surprising, I think, for me about it, actually, and a good thing, was how quick it was to move. Um, we were thinking it's going to take hours to move, but actually, in the end, with the sort of electric wheels, it ended up driving around and getting where we wanted it quite quickly. So that was really good. Um, it's the first time I've used it, um, and it did a really good job for us. Of course, they don't reveal the shots they got with it, but I know it's a cruel, yeah. cruel, cruel. But uh, so a lot of the things that we've talked about so far, the ones that we don't have available at BCAT, um, a lot of them you can rent at rental houses. There's like Cinequipped in um, uh, kind of near Brooklyn Park, um, like North Minneapolis area. Um, there's um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. I can't think of them off the top of my head. Alpha, alpha video. Yeah, alpha video might do it. Um, but Cinequipped is kind of my go-to. Yeah. I, I don't know. But if, yeah, they just have... They're, they're kind of the big one in the Twin Cities. Right, especially yeah, on the renting side of the cities. Um, yeah. I don't know about like the bigger steady cams and things like that, but they have like gimbals that you can rent and, and um, uh, sliders and stuff like that. So, the, um, uh, you know, obviously you got to pay to rent them and they're not super cheap But we just want to let you know that those are options, you know, if you like any of the stuff you saw here today um, There are options around the Twin Cities to rent a lot of these things obviously not the super techno 100 um, That would probably cost you eight grand a day at least to rent um, If not more <laughs> oh, <laughs> But it can it's, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's obviously it's pretty sweet. So yeah, the employees. Um, yeah, so you gotta uh, pay for this guy yeah. yeah, all right. Um, so yeah, how much? I wonder how much those couple of shots that they got cost them. I'm gonna look uh, up this movie now. Yeah. <laughs> the but uh, you can see, like they were saying, that was a that was a really cool shot going out over the soldiers because they were right. probably revealing the field as they're you know uh, I'd imagine probably widening out with the camera as they're they're coming out and revealing the whole field and revealing I'm guessing probably the the people that they were fighting um, and like you were saying you you know they didn't want to risk like a small helicopter um, or like a drone or something like that because um, those things create noise um, they're gonna uh, be distracting they're gonna um, have shadows possibly I mean this thing you know even with that you got to be careful of the angle of the sun and stuff like that mm -hmm. um, but um, but pretty pretty awesome piece of equipment there so mm -hmm. um, 
Last thing we're going to talk about, drones, also known as UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, drones have become just crazy, increasingly wildly popular in the past, you know, five, six years. Um, there's even even professionals in Hollywood are using them for uh, all sorts of different stuff right now, and the abilities that they have are just amazing. Every time they come up with a new drone, and you got the Mavic Pro too. You have right? the Mavic Two Pro, Mavic 2 Pro. Edidana. yeah. And um, so yeah. that's then the top left there. That's what Dietrich yeah, really, flies. Yeah. So this guy right here, and it's it's excellent. Um, in fact, our staff, uh, my supervisor and I, we got our F. These, huh. This is a USAS. Uh, basically a drone license from the FAA. So you take a test and then you get certified and then you can do commercial work using a drone and it's it's awesome. They're really cool. Um, one thing uh, I've learned using this one uh, as opposed to some of the bigger ones is that this thing is so portable you can literally set it up and get it in the air within about three minutes if you're fast um, once you get yeah. it down. You know you just say, oh, am I in a no-fly zone? Do I have to register? Nope, good to go. All right, boop, 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 yeah. bam. And you have the, which one do you have? Then? So I have the Mavic Air, which yeah. is basically just a smaller version of the, the Mavic Pro. Um, uh, not as nice of a camera on it, but still takes pretty good pictures and video and stuff like that, and even more portable. Mine can fold up. Uh, that, Like you were saying, the, these uh, arms on it fold up and then just tuck away into a case really nicely um, so it's extremely portable easy to set up mine folds down to about the size of a large smartphone I can literally fit it in my back pocket when it's folded up so that's that's really nice feature of it um, they have all sorts of really cool features on these newer ones where like you can draw a box around your subject and it'll just follow your subject wherever they're going. Mm -hmm. um, they also have, so like on this one, those two sensors that you see above the camera there, those detect objects. So when it's getting too close to an object, it'll just stop itself, which is really nice because sometimes you can't see how close you are to it. Um, even if you're watching it on a screen, it's hard to tell exactly how close you are to an object and you, with older drones, you might just run right into them. Um, but uh, and, and Ben, one of the things too with just drone operation in general, I don't know if either of you have drones in your life, but one of the things that's required as part of getting that license is that you uh, learn a term called VO or visual observer versus the pilot in command. So the person who's actually doing the flying is the pilot and your visual observer is the person who's looking at the physical location of the drone and saying, watch out, it's a tree! Um, mm -hmm. I, I actually broke our Mavic 2 uh, about Dude. a month and a half ago. What are you doing, man? You're breaking I all bre your equipment. I break all the equipment. Sorry. <laughs> but I broke it because uh, I was in a fire truck, and um, anybody can be a visual observer, mind you. So I had asked one of our, I'm not going to name them, but one of our firefighters to keep an eye out on it while I was piloting and we're going down the road. And of course, there's a big old branch right in the middle of the road. And he was like, oh, cool, look, I see it. Oh, I see it. And it hit the branch and bloop, fell, fell right out. And we had disabled this part, the kind of the, detection the part that would prevent you from doing that because I was a fool. Anyway, hard lesson learned, but well, they're super cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there are, there are times where you might want that to be um, deactivated, the yeah. sensor, because, yeah. you know, you might be flying through a tight space. And if you're a really, right. really good pilot, you know, and you have a good observer, you can get some really, really cool shots in tight spaces and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that is one thing with those sensors is, you know, they, it will just completely stop the drone and you mm -hmm. won't be able to fly it at all or you'll have to back away from the, sub, the object or whatever. Um, but obviously you can get a lot of really cool shots. I just realized I didn't put any videos in for examples, but there's, um, there's one uh, uh, drone pilot in, based in California that has done stuff for Hollywood and like uh, all sorts of commercials and stuff. Um, Chris Newman is his name if you want to look him up. Amazing, amazing drone pilot. Really good teacher too. He's got lessons that you, know, you can pay for. Um, uh, to learn how to get different shots and he even has a training course for getting your license and things mm -hmm. like that. But check him out, he's, he's really cool. Maybe I'll pull up his video, uh, one of his videos at the end. He shot, went to Scotland I think like last year, the year before, and he's got these just unbelievably beautiful shots with his drone out there. Um, but some limitations to drones, obviously 
battery life. Um, they, uh, I don't know about the Mavic 2, but mine lasts uh, about 20 minutes on a battery. Um, so I have four batteries for mine, but still, you know, you have to keep landing it to change out the battery and take off again. Um, and uh, I can, even with four batteries, you know, I can only get an hour and 20 minutes of footage, which, you know, is usually enough, depending on what you're doing, I guess. You know, if you're doing an all-day shoot, then you're going to want a ton of batteries or be charging yours constantly as you're going. But, you know, for most situations, that's, I, I rarely even go through all four of my batteries. Um, but uh, the newer drones also have really good battery detection that will actually tell you on the screen how much battery life is left. Mine, I don't know if yours does this, but mine when it hits, 20, I think it's 25% battery life left, it just starts beeping at me, which is super obnoxious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, but it's a good warning, you know, if you're not paying attention to the battery life. Um, it's a good warning. And then actually at, uh, I think at like 17% life, it just starts flying back on its own because that's these newer drones, they run off a of GPS. And when you initially take off, it sets a home point there. Um, and when the battery life gets too low or if you tell it to come home, it'll fly back automatically to the home point, um, which is really, really cool. Um, but uh, but yeah, I can't even go through an entire battery. I can, t I can cancel it once it hits 17% mm -hmm. and starts coming back. I can cancel it. But then I think once it hits like Eight, like 10 or 8 percent or something it comes back and it's like you you can't override it anymore it's like I'm done um, so you can't ever actually use a full battery on it but that's good because you obviously don't want your drone to die in midair and come crashing down I had used to have an older drone that it didn't have any of those features and it batteries died on it a few times surprisingly it still worked but I, I crashed it when I ran ran through batteries so um, some other limitations on them, obviously there are FAA restrictions. Like Dietrich said, if you're going to fly commercially, you do need to get um, your license for that. It's called a Part 107 mm -hmm. certificate. Um, and then uh, there are some restrictions, FAA restrictions, that apply to both commercial and just doing it as a hobby. And that is uh, you must fly within line of sight. You have to fly below 400 feet, which, I mean, 400 feet is pretty high. You can get some pretty it's awesome pretty shots high. at 400 feet. Obviously, a lot of people break this law a lot, and they go higher than that. Um, your drone can't be more than 55 pounds. You can't fly within five miles of an airport unless you notify the airport and air traffic control first. Um, smaller airports, I've I've heard people say that they are able to get a hold of air traffic control, and most of them are most of the time they're pretty cool about it, and they'll say, oh yeah, you've got a window for 15 minutes here if you want to go fly. Um, but um, otherwise, like Dietrich was saying, there's a lot of apps out there that'll tell you if you're in a no-fly zone or not, um, and just avoid those areas. Well, one um, of them to use too is called the Air Map. And what it mm -hmm. does is it's actually synced, it's, it's created by the FAA, so what will happen is you program in the duration of how long you're flying, where you are, um, the radius, all that sort of stuff, and it'll send a message uh, to the uh, control tower at, let's just say, MSP, right, because we're in that vicinity, and you're, if you're in that area, what it'll do is it'll kick back a text message giving you approval. But it's, it's really on you as the pilot to pay attention to any low-flying aircraft. So what comes to mind, at least for me, is Flying Cloud Airport, where you have some of the f smaller prop planes that are, you know, just mom and pop just flying up and doing whatever, or those kind of planes, not like the giant jumbo jets. Those are the ones that freak me out as a pilot. <laughs> so I try almost never to fly near Flying Cloud if I can help it, mm -hmm. um, unless I've, like, given them very explicit like instructions that I will be here at this time yeah but in Bloomington I'm not sure are there any restrictions well you guys are right well, yeah you close to MSP yeah. yeah and then there's the other I don't know if it's is it flying cloud that's like straight west of here correct yeah, yeah so yeah, that's so we're where we're, we're yeah. at right now at the Civic Plaza is like right in between the two yeah. um, so we're in a, a, a area where you can fly drones but if you go just like half a mile that way you're in MSP airspace so right. um, so you do have to be careful of that when I <laughs> when I flown my drone drone before, um, uh, there's been times where I'll think I'm in an okay zone and it says it's okay and everything and I'll take off and after being up there for 10 minutes or something I'll hear 
like a helicopter or something in the distance. And even if I can't see it, if I hear it, I land my drone right away because I don't, I don't want to be anywhere near, you know, cause any kind of accident or anything like that. So even if I hear uh, an airplane or a helicopter, I'll, I'll bring it back. So it's just being, uh, you know, a cautious pilot and being a safe pilot um, is really what's super important. Um, but yeah, like Dietrich was saying, um, if, air, if you tell air traffic control, I'm only going to fly at 100 feet um, and I'm only flying within this area or something like that, and they say they gave you the green light, then, you know, as long as you fly it in the manner that you told them you're going to, you, you should be okay and then just keep an eye out for other aircraft in the area. But um, there's, there's been reports of, of uh, commercial airlines England. sucking drones into their jets. Yeah. Um, some of them have been proven that it was a drone. Some of them have not. Yeah. Um, but, um, but There are a lot of reckless pilots out there. A lot of there. reckless pilots. So it, and one thing that I can't stress enough is like one bad apple really makes everyone look bad. So mm -hmm. like even I'll I'll I'm more than happy to call the FAA on somebody who's being a jerk, you know, <laughs> because I don't want my flying ability to be restricted by somebody else's lack of respect for the airspace. Mm -hmm. So my, the the thing I want to get to uh, is is techniques though using a drone. Yeah. So what have you found, Ben? Well, as far so. As using that? Um, well, again, with a lot of the newer drones. Um, they have the ability to like follow a subject, which is really cool. Um, some drones are faster than other drones, but usually, you know, you can f you could follow a car going 25 miles per mm -hmm. hour pretty easily. Um, you, a lot of them also have, uh, especially DJI, they have these things called quick shots, which are pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still you would draw a, a box around your subject, and then you would hit go, and it'll do like either like shooting away from you, or it'll do like a, a corkscrew around you, things mm -hmm. like that. And if you're a good pilot, you can do those things manually too. I mean, there's like endless possibilities for different types of shots that you can get with these, um, and especially ones that have also a gimbal on it, like here. So this one is made by GoPro, and that actually actually uses, um, oh I have it right here, yeah. so that actually uses this inside part of, of the um, Karma here, so this is called the Karma grip and then this head here is just called the Karma and this, and then that's the Karma drone, so then this would slide into the front of that drone there, um, so it has the ability to go back and forth between the handheld gimbal and the, the drone, which is pretty cool. Um, but that allows you to, a lot of them, a lot of the newer ones allow you to at least control the tilt up and down. So, you know, you can do these really cool revealing shots where you might kind of start coming toward your subject and then you start to fly over the top of it and as you fly over the top you tilt down um, and do this straight down shot as you're flying mm -hmm. at, uh, overhead. Um, really like endless possibilities of what you can do with these. Obviously, you know, uh, just like they talked about in the crane video, you have to um, be aware of the sunlight. Um, if you don't want the shadow of your drone being in, like on top of your subject or in the shot at all, mm -hmm. um, you got to be aware of the the angle of the sun and things like that. Um, I'll tell you one thing. My favorite part about using a drone these days is you, you know how you can sometimes find those old timey photos that you know some poor sap in an airplane was going back and forth trying to get that one perfect shot or in a helicopter. They, it took them thousands of dollars to do. You can do this for like 2000 bucks, even yeah. less than that. Yeah. And what's really neat, um, I've just wrapped up doing some pieces on the Dino Police Department's history, and there's a shot of Southdale that I was able to find the old-timey photo but then also f get that shot with the drone so you do you do a nice dissolve between the two to show that transition in time is that drones just allow you to do so many cool things um, mm -hmm. another example that I that I use because I, I work with fire and police a lot is I had it hovering above the fire truck as it was pulling out of the fire department's garage and so as the sirens go out it goes out and you, it reveals the whole station, right? So that's another way you can use it, just making it really nice and tight. I'm not a really good pilot. I swear, <laughs> I'm horrible at, at flying. Well, yeah, you crashed it. I know, exactly. See, I already crashed it. But I, at least for me, I've found that um, sometimes doing less, like only going, like using it like a slider or using it just to go up and down is just as powerful as anything else you could shoot because... If you try to do too much, then 
you know, your chances mm -hmm. of screwing up the shot are pretty high. I, anyway, that's just yeah. my opinion. You know, and then, like, shots, like, going out, like, over water and stuff like that, uh, especially, oh, you know, yeah. big big bodies of water. Yeah, these are that's just... That's a gorgeous are, shot. <laughs> merging the two times. Merging the two, yeah, the two yeah. seasons. This one, I believe, was one that won uh, an award for, like, best drone shot in 2018 oh, or something that like that. It's a polar, polar bear? It's a polar bear. Stretching across? Stretching across, too. Yeah. Um, it's really neat. Yeah, two pieces of ice there. Um, <laughs> but it's but it allows you to fly out over water and get these really awesome angles that you obviously can't get with like a crane or something like that. And right. uh, you could do it with uh, with a helicopter, but it's going to cost you you know at least a few hundred dollars to to have someone take you out to get those kinds of shots. Um, and uh, you know you could get these shots m multiple times with a drone, and it would pay for itself pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. um, so obviously. Some, I'm surprised you don't use them for weddings, because I feel like it's a big request a these days. Really use them, yeah. yeah. Okay. But you just have that establishing shot. Right. So much. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I, I've seen people shooting weddings in like downtown Minneapolis with right. some, and and all they all they do is just like an establishing shot or something, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's, the noise. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can't do it during the ceremony and stuff. <laughs> Will you marry me? What? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It's another limitation what? of them is they sound like a pack of bees. Yeah. So they're, <laughs> they're pretty loud. Um, uh, and then whatever you got to do to get the shot. So I thought some of these were kind of funny, especially the I love the that. Chicken. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken stabilizer. Chicken um, stabilizer. Obviously just a joke, but yeah, this, I like the short bus too, a Walmart DIY camera dolly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, but some of these are actually, you know, professional. Like the guy in the bottom left is using a, a Segway. Segway, but he's also got a, a Steadicam on it. Um, these people are this just using. Is, that's so cool. That's a pretty awesome yeah. rig there that's on the awesome front of the rig. car. It's like a crane, gimbal what, what is this mixture guy thing. Doing? Are those yeah. all GoPros? Yeah, there's a bunch of GoPros. <laughs> so I, I put this as a joke to see how the the head the, the helmet cam has come along throughout the years. This is an old like film camera with multiple lenses on it, and then this guy doing a <laughs> Canon DSLR and a bunch of GoPros and his this person funny. that's pretty creative, taping their phone up oh, to, yeah. a, to a remote control car. Um, but yeah, yeah so you know, what there's a lot of different creative things that you can do, even doing DIY stuff, making your own mm -hmm. um, stabilizers and stuff. So, um, any other burning questions from anybody? We're about at the time. I was going to say, or anything I... else you guys would like to share about your experiences using these systems? Game of Thrones. Oh, nice. <laughs> Are you? It's a different Scott Newman. Oh, or I mean, Chris Newman. Newman. Don't, don't get started on Game of Thrones. We already covered that earlier. I wanted to see if I could find. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. So when did you buy this show? When I purchased a couple week, a couple years ago. A couple years ago. But okay. uh, I got put on the back burner for all learning the camera. Sure. I took a long yeah. the camera. I haven't used the, this style of camera before. Yeah, do your arms get tired? Or does your arm, have, have you reused it to that point yet? I've on one, okay. on one shoot and, and no. No. There it is. Yeah. I think it was about four hours. Three hours of shooting, and mostly on that, on the gimbal. Where is it? Well, and you know, one thing I love about I mean, the I'm mirrorless sure ones the versus the DSLRs, or even like, um, like the standard video cameras. Not with all the different the links weight. to the videos. I like, could send those to people if they wanted. Unless you them. have a brace or something, um, it just gets so heavy. It's really cool. Yeah, you can you could find them just by searching for them online for sure. I yeah, see this, yeah, his video from, right here. I see the title for it, but yeah. it's not actually on his channel. Yeah, it's a really really awesome video. I don't know why it's not actually in here. Yeah. Ah, uh, I'd heard about it. it I haven't seen it yet. Uh, yeah, the Oscars, documentary. Yeah, yeah. yeah, one best documentary. Yeah, I wanna I wanna watch it. Yeah. He's from uh, Duluth, right? Uh, or Mankato. Mankato, shoot, the city. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, um, we can we can cut the recording. Thanks for watching, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for watching, time. guys. There See it you. is.